Welcome to the Evolution 2.0 podcast, where we explore the intersection of art, technology, business, biology, and spirituality. Here, you'll discover new trends in evolution that are changing the way we think about everything. This is your host, Perry Marshall, author of Evolution 2.0, 80-20 Sales and Marketing, and guides to Ethernet, Google, and Facebook. I'm founder of the Evolution 2.0 Prize, a quest for the missing link between earth science, the information age, and life itself. Let's join the conversation now. So this is Perry Marshall. I'm here with Steve Benner. Steve is a very, very respected chemist in in the um, in the origin of life space and in the in the astrobiology space. And a few years ago, I read a book by Susan Mazur uh, talking about really kind of covering the whole spectrum of interesting origin of life personalities. And Steve was my single favorite person in the whole book. And I reached out to him a couple of years ago and we had a discussion about my uh, Evolution 2.0 prize. And along the way, I picked up this book, Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method, which is a book that he wrote. I guess it was, uh, Steve, it was inspired by conversations you were having with your son and maybe trying to expand on... Uh, on the definition of science that his science teachers were giving him? Is well, that, yeah, that's, uh, of course, a problem. We, you, you, when you're in eighth grade, you do an eighth grade science fair project, and that science fair project is supposed to uh, begin with your suggesting a hypothesis, a set of deftly chosen experiments that will, no matter how they turn out, either confirm or deny the hypothesis, and you're graded on this, and interviewed on this as you present your poster in the in the large hall and of course the problem with that as an yep. introduction to science is that simple hypothesis taste testing has two features which are problematic right the first is that it doesn't do anything interesting so the interesting kinds of questions you're interested in like how did life originate or are there aliens out there in the cosmos or um, any of the other big questions really don't lend themselves easily to hypothesis testing um, and second, um, the hypotheses that you test are very scripted. And so you very much narrowly focus your uh, experimental efforts on things that you uh, know will turn out to be correct, on hypotheses that are likely to be validated. And of course, if you don't do that, then your funding agency or, or your journal editor will do that for you. And so um, this gives students a bad idea of what science is, and in, in some sense turns them off from science. So what science actually is, is an intellectual discipline and an intellectual activity with a field appropriate method for you to not always arrive at the conclusion that you set out to arrive at. And that's a much more interesting thing. It's not necessarily something that's interesting at the eighth grade level. Um, and so in some sense, what we do at eighth grade is to do something that's age appropriate in terms of letting them have a piece of what scientists can do when they are trying to implement um, a bigger uh, a research program that has a bigger goal in mind. Of course, Aristotelian logic is also an element of that process. And I have not yet found in anywhere in any of our curriculum at the junior or senior high school level for sure, where they actually teach you formal logic. So I you know, go over from time to time to the Gainesville International Baccalaureate Program and you know, put up on the board a syllogism and ask if the argument is correctly formulated in one case, you know, if the earth uh, were going around the sun at 11,000 miles an hour, we would feel it. We don't feel it. Therefore, the earth is not going around the sun at 11,000 miles an hour. Is that a correct argument? Well, the answer is it is. But you got to keep in mind that even at the International Baccalaureate Program here in Gainesville, Florida, where many of the students are sons and daughters of professors at the university here and have gotten more math training than I do and have gotten 800 SAT scores, whatever it is these days, they don't know the concepts of formal logic. So it's an interesting question why we teach them how to do science, you know, as the scientific method, you know, hypothesis-based testing without teaching them formal logic. So having watched my son go through all of this, <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. you know, if you're in the International Baccalaureate Program, there is a 
theory of knowledge section, which wraps up the senior year. And as parents, of course, we went over and watched what our kids were learning, and we discovered that they were looking at the observer paradox. Someone was presenting the observer paradox in quantum mechanics and leading them to believe this was a proof of the existence of God. That's when I decided I should get more involved in my kids' education, and that's how this book ended up being written. Interesting. Well, th this book is quite good. And I mean, I've, I've got tons of books about biology and chemistry and chemistry is not a weak, I mean, uh, not a strong suit for me. It's actually one of my weak points. And so considering that it's, there's a lot of chemistry in this book, I was really impressed. And if you could look very closely, you'd see I've got all these different pages um, with little corners turned and lots of underlines because what you do in this book is you explore all kinds of ideas that people have about where life came from, how it's constructed, how you would detect it. Like uh, there's very interesting parts about, okay, so back in the seventies before they actually got a spacecraft to Mars, it's like, well, what should we put on the spacecraft to measure it? What inferences could we make based on physical measurements that would tell us things? And, and then all of these chains of logic have these, there's all these little, doors that go this way and that. And it's, I mean, it's really, really fascinating, I, I have to say. So, well, thanks. I mean, um, I mean, it was helped because we got Jake Fuller, who was the political cartoonist for the Gainesville Sun, to do about 25 cartoons throughout the book, which sort of helped make the points. But yeah, I mean, you got to keep in mind that a lot of what's going on in science sort of centers around the Feynman dictum that people are easy to fool and the easiest person to fool is yourself. This is Richard Feynman, the physicist, right? Who, hey, well, he comes up with lots of these things, like, you know, science begins with a disbelief or a distrust in the opinions of experts, right? And so there's all of these problems that you deal with in science because science is, as, a, as an intellectual activity, one of the very few that actually teaches you that the opinions that you are given to you by the best historical figures in your craft may be wrong. And that's where actually science exists. Because if it's not wrong, it's not interesting to, to pursue it and it doesn't get pursued. <laughs> but one of the most, I mean, I don't mean to be like Paul Feyerabend is a wonderful philosopher of science who points out how, I guess he would use the word corrupt, the practice of science is influenced by sociology and fundraising and all these other features. When I, when I talk to the creationist community here in Gainesville from time to time, I'll give a talk on what science is that religion is not and then the subtitle for that conference is when why scientists themselves do so very little of it, right? So scientists actually do very little science, meaning coming out with uh, you know, uh, conclusions that are different from the ones that they set out to come out with. Much of what scientists do actually is advocacy, right? Which is sort of the opposite of science, right? When you're an advocate, you're supposed to you know, if, I'm, if I hire you as my lawyer, Perry, and I, I don't want you going into the courtroom and saying, well, Benner might be guilty. On the other hand, he might be innocent. And there's if, no, I want you to suppress the evidence that says that I'm guilty and to focus on the evidence that says that I am not guilty. And of course, in science, it's almost the exact opposite. If you're going to be a successful scientist, you take the theory that you want to believe and you weight more heavily the evidence against that theory and that's a way, you know, scientists are not objective, right? Scientists must learn how to manage their intrinsic non-objectivity. And this is one way in which that's done by weighing evidence that's against um, your view. And of course, it's worse than that. There's, a epidemi there's an epistemological point to that, right? That is it, unless you can live in the universe, which is where you believe the exact opposite of what you want to believe, not only can you not say that your view is correct, you you really can't even say that you understand what your view is, right? So the ability to understand this dialectic is a way in which you understand what you actually are thinking, which is why it really annoys me when I hear people say on various topics that the science is settled and, you know, I, you know, my alma mater at Yale, you know, they're having a hard time letting speakers come in who are opposing the, and the best that they can come up with is the statement, well, if you listen to someone who's, opposed to you, you will be able to hone your arguments more finely in favor of your own view. And that's missing the point. If you listen to somebody who's opposed to you, that's how you learn what your view is. Right. 
It's, yes. and, 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 and so truth is known by its juxtaposition with falsehood. And so falsehood and truth both have equal value in our trying to understand to what extent we understand the universe around us. So Steve, this is, this is fabulous. In fact, we, we talked two years ago and you talked about science versus advocacy. And I was going to bring that up maybe yeah. later in our interview after we talked about your eight, you know, your, yeah, sure. your eight base pairs thing instead of four, but, but let's, we're talking about it now. So let, let's, let's talk about it. Um, I, I, I think it just needs to be underscored a little bit that that actual science is nearly the opposite of advocacy, but the pra- the the profession of science requires a great deal of advocacy to get funding to get published. Like it's this real conundrum and. Like I, I had a conversation with somebody uh, a while back where they, it, it, they were a postdoc at a big institution and they told me that she's actually seen multiple situations where they did the experiment, they got the result, but they wrote up the proposal to do the experiment and then got the funding, not telling the funding source that they already knew the result so that they could get the result. And then because the funding sources are so conservative, like, and it was, it was almost like they were following the eighth grade version of science. (laughs) Well, that's a lower level issue. I mean, the notion that you're not allowed to fund research retroactively is actually an item of law. No, I mean, I'm not saying that law is not truth, but it's not quite the same plane, right? The law is a human construct. And um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the questions of how we evaluate science, of course, you know, everybody does advocacy. I do advocacy when I write a letter of recommendation for one of my students to go out and get a job, right? Um, I, I will yeah. often point out, however, strengths and weaknesses, but I assure you that when I go to write grant applications, right? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like Gilbert and Sullivan, right? You know, professional license have carried too far. Your chances of advancement may certainly mar. And this also happens to apply to science. So you don't actually want to get caught being a terrible advocate. But, but if you actually look at, uh, you know, lots of fields in chemistry, there are some that you've never heard of, like the non-classical carbocation problem. It has to do with how you draw the structures of molecules, carbon containing molecules, organic molecules, which have a positive charge on them. This is basically the problem, how you draw them. It's a really an argument about the model for reality rather than an argument about reality. But more common, you know, if you go look at the neutralist selectionist dispute in, in an area that you're more familiar with in evolutionary biology, you know, that went on for years and years and years, which was an argument at the end of the day about really nothing, right? It was a model of how molecules change when they are subject to selective pressure in general. But of course, there is no such thing as a general molecule. Every amino acid is distinctive and it will change to contribute to fitness or not in a particular way, a way particular to that amino acid in that particular molecule, in that particular organism, in that particular environment. But the fight went on for years and it was an advocacy fight. It was, you know, Kamara and his students arguing against Margolish and his students. And at the end of the day, another generation had to come along and, uh, you know, displace these and realize that we're really not arguing about what we want to argue about, which is how do individual molecules contribute to fitness. But yeah, that, that's right. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why these eight letters are important. One of the ways you manage your inability to come to conclusions when you are a, a non-objective advocate is by doing what's called synthesis, right? And this is, again, goes back to Richard Feynman, who always has the right phrase for the right moment. But, you know, what that I, you know, I cannot make, I do not understand. But the model is, you know, is, is, is familiar. I mean, with lots of people, I mean, the Mars Polar Orbiter, you know, was going out to Mars which, with the guidance system software and metric and the guidance system hardware and English system of feet, pounds and inches. All the way out, they, they knew, if you read the mission logs, they knew something was wrong, but it was possible to rationalize it away all, all the way along. But, you know, reality 
intervenes when you have a grand challenge, like putting this rocket into orbit around Mars, um, and it crashes, and that it gives you the kick in the side of the head. Um, and uh, well, you've written about some of these concepts, right? So the the, the idea of, of, with biology is the same thing. We think we have a good bead on on how evolution works. We think we have a good bead on how biology works. Every eighth grader in their science fair project can draw the structure of a double helix, and most of them know that A pairs with T and G pairs with C. And if you look at the details of this molecule, you can say, hey, I think I got it. Molecular evolution is based on this. But then you all of a sudden have these questions like, well, do I really understand it? Or remember, in chemistry, uh, for those of you who have taken a course in chemistry, you know that explanations are sort of post hoc. It's sort of like Rudyard Kipling. In evolutionary biology, they refer to the just so story, you know, how the zebra got his stripes when he fell asleep under a ladder one day. And, and, but there, the problem is that it had the zebra's spots instead of stripes, right? You would have come up with an equally coherent explanation post hoc to rationalize that fact. And for those of you who teach chemistry, we know this all the time. So some student will come up and say, well, why is this molecule more reactive than that? And we say, well, it's because, and we'll give an explanation. And then the student will say, wait, no, no, I've got it exactly wrong. That react molecule is more reactive than this one. And then you'll discover that the chemist can come up with an equally effective explanation for that. So these post hoc explanations are rationalizations that may or may not be tied to underlying reality. And one of the ways you can test that is by saying, okay, great. You think that double helices and DNA are important for evolution? Great, make your own evolving system, but just don't do what natural evolution has provided to you um, mm -hmm. by historical accidents. And so that's how you get to these research projects which say, hey, what you're gonna do is make an eight letter DNA that is going to have evolutionary capabilities on a molecular platform different from what has emerged from prebiotic chemistry plus four and a half billion years of Darwinian evolution. And if you're so smart, <laughs> you ought to be able to make it and to get it to work. And of course, if you made a fundamental mistake in your theory, the, the system crashes, not on Mars, but in the lab. And then you know you can work your way back from that failure and figure out what it is you were assuming was true that is in fact not true. And so this synthesis is driving by, you know, dragging scientists, kicking and screaming across uncharted terrain where they're forced to ask and answer unscripted questions, right? It forces you to encounter the problems that you not, need not necessarily even thought were problems when you began. And by that, synthesis can drive discovery and paradigm changes in ways that analysis, hypothesis-based research simply cannot. Well, well Steve, I, heavy I, stuff, I'm right? really enjoying this. <laughs> well, it, look, it is, but look, I, I don't frequently have conversations with scientists where they actually use the word epistemology. <laughs> okay, like, I mean, you know, I should. They, 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 the physicists, of course, think they're closer to God. Than, yeah, but never mind. Let's not go there. <laughs> yes, well, no, but this is a right, right? I mean, your problem is you do, you do require, as you try to manipulate the universe around you, I mean, this is as old as the Paleolithic, you do require a model for reality that in some sense corresponds to reality. I mean, I'm not one of these yeah. modern philosophers who will deny reality, right? The, the existence thereof. Um, but you know, it's, it's an important to understand in your interaction with models, you want to believe things more than others and you um, think things are true and things are false. And uh, very often the opposite is the case and you need to find that out and that's a process. I can't just exhort you, please, please, please be, Objective, it doesn't work. You have to have a process, that process requires a discipline, that discipline requires education, and it requires a culture that's willing to tolerate it, right? Which is not necessarily any particular culture, right? The, the story is that the Chinese, you know, where they're saying their junk's out for discovery, you know, in the 15th century, the Chinese saw that this would lead to a challenge to their rules, rulers, and they put an end to it, right? So you need a culture that will tolerate this. 
Well, one of my colleagues said to me a few months ago, Perry, I think one of the reasons you're successful is you have a healthy disdain for marketing. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and I'm listening to you here and I'm going, well, Steve, I, I think one of the reasons you're successful in science is you have a healthy disdain for the scientific profession. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the profession, you, you have, as, I mean, I had a, a mentor named Jeremy Knowles, who's no longer living. He was chairman of the chemistry department at Harvard when I was an assistant professor there. He would say, you, you're not, you're not loyal to institutions. You don't have a disdain for institutions. You're talking about people. You're loyal to people, right? Yeah. And there are good scientists yeah. and there are better scientists and there are bad scientists and there are worse scientists. And all of us are capable, you know, of infinite perfection or infinite error. And you have to recognize that. So there's a sort of this concept of, I mean, I guess the Templeton Foundation, which I've been working with over the last few years, refers to it as humility, right? But you really have to understand that the game here is to prove yourself wrong. You can have fun at that, but you have to be very yeah. careful when you interact with a, with, a, with a funding agency or for that matter with your peers. In doing, I mean, the, we have Linus Pauling is alleged to have memorized, you know, the uh, pi or some of these uh, physical constants of many decimal points right before he walked into class so he could write, write them off and he would say, oh, Pauling is a genius. Well, that's not the point. Right, not whether Pauling is a genius or not, it's whether his model for the double helix is correct or not, or for the triple helix in his case. And that's, uh, I mean, and you can have a lot of fun with that. I mean, that, that makes science a lot of fun when you understand it's sort of this kind of game. But, you know, it's a problem getting funding now, isn't it? <laughs> so, so marketing, I mean, I tell my kids that they're in research and I'm in marketing, right, in my lab, right, because I write the grant applications, right? And their job is to make sure that when I write the grant applications, I actually know what, in fact, I'm writing about. <laughs> and so they're in research. The marketing is important. But no, I don't have a, I don't think, I, I think I don't have a disdain for science as a process. I think I kind of like it. It's just that I don't view the science process as hypothesis testing. And it's in its most important aspect. Obviously, hypothesis testing is a part of it, but it's off in the corner someplace as a tool, just like the Aristotelian syllogism. Well, when I read what you write and what you speak about, I find you to be very iconoclastic um, and willing to question the treasured dogmas, which I, I think is, well, is fine, very right? refreshing. But, well, it's what we're well, supposed to be doing, right? Well, it is, it is, but you, you know, the world has this funny way of, of forking into these different groups. And so you can, you, you can have all these various flavors of science skeptics, which might all have very good points to make, but they're not actually doing anything. Okay. And then you have people that are just, you know, chugging along and right. doing their stuff and you, you, you're straddling those two worlds and you're actually clearly getting something done which yeah, that, yeah. that's no. what I admire. Well, that supports the problem. It's, you know, you can be a skeptic for the purpose of being skeptics, skeptical. Um, and uh, that's fine. It's just that you have to be skeptical against or about with respect to your own viewpoints. I mean, this is really one of the things that's wrong with the origins of life as a field. If you go through the literature, there's many, many, many papers that are skeptical, but they almost always are skeptical about other people's work, right? You really need to be skeptical <laughs> about your own work, right? And, yeah. and of course, science has a mechanism, right? If uh, Science manages the fact that most people cannot be skeptical, have not been trained to be skeptical, mm. or if they have been trained to be skeptical about their own work, I've had it beaten out of them by funding agencies or tenure review or any of the other sociological things that Feyerabend or these other sociologists of science mention. Um, but yeah, it's it, at the end of the day, the goal here is to recognize that the skepticism against your own uh, views allows a dialectic to move from the literature. I mean, if you're not skeptical, what happens is you the literature, if it's a fair fight, if there's not censorship or calling people deniers or this kind of thing, if there's a fair fight, the literature will eventually work the problem out. And if 
necessary yeah. only when the advocates die and then the next generation comes in. And that's a well-known discussion yeah. in scientific sociology. But if you can internalize that dialectic, if you can have the fight internally in your lab or even within your own brain, you are way ahead of the game because you can go seven or eight steps before your desire to believe what you want to believe trips you up. And then you have to publish something and then somebody else will catch your mistake. And so if you can catch mm -hmm. your mistakes, the more you can catch your mistakes mm -hmm. internally by being skeptical about your own stuff, um, the, the better, the farther along you get before you're caught out by your colleagues in the public literature. But that happens in, in labs. I mean, you'll see good laboratories are run by a research supervisor whose job it is, is to shoot down the gel or the data point or the curve that the student has brought to him or her uh, and to act as that internal check because, but also to train the student to be able it. And it's, a, it's a really a discipline. I mean, it's a very difficult discipline to acquire. And again, it's not a discipline that's valued in the world of law or the world of politics. Uh, in the world of law, it's quite clear. Your job as my lawyer is to defend me if that requires yeah. suppressing evidence, I want you to do it. You're being paid to do it. In politics, right, the goal is to get yourself elected. And uh, if that requires suppressing evidence, that's what you do. Um, but in science, it's sort of the opposite of that. And if you want to be productive, you really have to be on both sides of these issues every time. So that Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you supposed to believe that, hey, alien life exists on Mars. But on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, or if you're Jewish, you take Saturday off and do it on Sunday, you are opposed to aliens being present on Mars. And if you can get that internal conflict, the dialect internalized, it's, it's actually quite productive, and it makes you much more successful than you would be if you said, ah, I think I know how life originated, and then bludgeon that to death. But it's fun. I mean, mind you, I mean, I say, hey, it's Monday. It's time to believe that life exists on Mars. And then that Tuesday, oops, nope, nope, not really. And then Wednesday, I see that little face on Mars. Yeah, there's life. And then Thursday, I say, oh, no. And, then, you know, you can have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> well, okay. So you have this paper in science, Hachimoji DNA and RNA, a genetic system with eight building blocks. Um, and well, other than the fact that most people don't know that Hachimoji means eight letters in Japanese, it's, it's a title of a paper. It's pretty much in plain English, and it's a, it's a straightforward, it's like, hey, we figured out how to have eight letters in DNA instead of four, and it was written up in the New York Times. It, it got some nice headlines, and it is, I mean, it uh, probably goes in the, in the annals of origin of life research as a fairly significant step forward here. So what are, what's one or two sacred cows that had to get killed just for you to, to get this thing out the door? Yeah. Okay. So first you have heard of an emoji, right? Which is an emotional letter. Hence that's. Oh, why right. At, at oh, energy. okay. So we actually had to explain that to a number of people, but once we do, you've heard of emoji and that's of course coming from, Pokemon or some other Japanese cultural thing. So, right, so, so exactly. So what, what, what sacred cows had to be? Well, there, there are three sort of answers to that question. One is simply a technological answer, right? That is that when you do DNA chemistry or molecular biology with four letters, you can order up reagents from Sigma Aldridge or some chemical supply house. You can sequence DNA almost for nothing these days. Um, when you have an eight letter genetic system, you have to build the infrastructure to support it because nothing mm. unnatural is, can be bought. You just don't go out and sequence eight letter DNA by sending it out. And so a lot of the technical aspects are in that paper or how we go back and mm. get the enzymes that will copy eight letter DNA into eight letter RNA or how we get chemical pipelines to make the building blocks or how we do the sequencing of this to know that we've made what we think we've made. But the, 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 the question you've asked is about what sacred cows were, and you gotta keep in mind that there's, there's been a couple, there's been a history here, because when Watson Crick came up with their structure of the double helix, which you know, you can get on fine jewelry with the double helix, you can see statues of it in courtyards, I mean, it's a wonderful structure. They looked at that molecule and said it was obviously correct and so did the community. 
partly because it was so obvious from the structure alone how you had kids, how you made replicas of it. But of course, I had very little data to support that model. Most of the data they had was stolen from Rosalind Franklin, right, who of course died very young from radiation damage, as far as I can tell, but she had cancer. But, mm. but the bottom line was that very little data led to, nevertheless, the structure was very easily accepted because it met a need in the culture for some connection between a very long field of sort of organismic evolution, which Darwin and fossils and, and supported, and a, and a uh, molecular need to understand how you just had kids, how cells divided and replicated and passed along information. And actually, there was a paper by a guy named Erwin Schrodinger, a physicist of some distinction in 1943, where he su knew sufficient amount I mean, he did not know the structure of DNA, but he knew enough about physics to realize that to replicate the amount of information that you that represents Perry Marshall, right? You had to have a high level of fidelity, one that could not be met by simply binding two things together, but you had something, we required something which is called the physics of phase trans transitions. It's represented, for example, by the melting of ice at a very sharp temperature. And therefore the crystallization of water to make ice excludes impurities and that was something that he understood so when watson crick look at the structures of at and gc base pairs they said hey they're the same size they fit into what uh, the crystal structure the uh, that schrodinger had talked about in fact the aperiodic crystal structure it's very interesting because watson and crick were not familiar early on with the uh, concepts of wet biochemistry, which had actually said that the amount of A in the DNA was equal to the amount of T and the amount of G in DNA was equal to the amount of C in DNA, which is actually also telling you that A pairs with T and G pairs with C. This was wet biochemistry that was developed by a man named Chargaff, so-called Chargaff rules. Chargaff, of course, went and visited Watson Crick and discovered that they did not know about his rules. <laughs> I mean, they sat there yeah. and talked about helices and the pitches and the dimensions and the diameter. So when Chargaff gets back to his lab, he writes, he met Watson and Crick, who were two pitch men in search of a helix, who were so stupid that they didn't even know his, <laughs> his rules. And of course, he missed the big discovery, which Watson and Crick are famous for, which shows that sometimes a crystallographer and an ornithologist, which is what Watson was, can do things that people in the community, well, can see things that people in the community cannot see. But that structure mm. stuck, right? And so that structure is very simple. Yep. It has phosphates on the outside. Linus Pauling had phosphates on the inside. That's why he was wrong. Phosphates on the mm. outside have these repeating negative charges. People thought that the repeating negative charges were bad. They repel each other. And so it causes the DNA duplex to be less stable than it might be. But that hydrogen bonding is holding the base pairs together and there has to be size complementarity. Big has to pair with, with small. Now, one of the things that happened in the 1990s was Myron Goodman at USC came along and started doing an analysis of this and said, wait a minute, hydrogen bonds in water are not worth very much. Why? Well, because water forms hydrogen bonds to the bases itself. So every time I have to form hydrogen bonds between two bases to make the double helix, I got to break hydrogen bonds to water, and so there should be a net wash. You make a couple of hydrogen bonds, but you lose a couple of hydrogen bonds. You make hydrogen bonds between the bases to form the duplex, but you lose hydrogen bonds to water. And so, so Myron in 1997 decided that, well, hydrogen bonds were irrelevant, that the base pair could be established, genetic information could be transferred, the Schrodinger periodic, aperiodic crystal structure could be fulfilled without hydrogen bonds, with just hydrophobic pairs. There's a nice guy at Stanford named Eric Kuhl, who actually, at the same time, and this is partly, well, Goodman proposed this in the early 90s, in the mid to late 90s, Eric came up with his own base pair, which had no hydrogen bonds between it. It was just size complementary, big paired with small. And he showed that this was able to replicate DNA, it was able to be, well, the DNA polymerases were able to replicate base pairs, at least one or two examples of them containing just size complementarity without hydrogen bonds at all. And then Ichiro Hirao, in, at the time in Japan, now in Singapore, Floyd Romersberg, very bright boy in, uh, 
I guess he's no longer a boy, I should not call him that, but a very bright scientist in, in Scripps in La Jolla. Uh, he, Floyd went through six, I think 3,600 of memory serves possible candidates for hydrophobic pairs that would be size complementary without being hydrogen bonding complementary. And he came up with some that worked and he mm. even got some of them to go into living cells. And uh, that was also written really? times in 19, uh, sorry, 2014 by Andy Pollack, who wrote the title that, you know, these extra letters in the genetic alphabet raise both hope and fear because the idea was here, Floyd is monkeying around with DNA. <laughs> and he's going to create an alternative life form, which is going to escape from his laboratory, make it to the San Diego zoo and eat the penguins. Okay. That, and so that was captured in the New York Times. More on that later. So one of the things that happened was that people decided that hydrogen bonds were not necessary. Now the catch to this is of course, that if you have oily things, hydrophobic things, and then the active side of a polymerase, they will pair and like a Watson Crick pair does edge on, which is what I'm doing with my fingers right now. Outside of an active side of a polymerase that constrains them to do that, they slip on top of each other because that's, they're oily and they want to interact with each other on top of each other. And, and Floyd showed that for some of his pairs. So the question was how many of these could you put together in a row, whether you could evolve. And you got to remember that to evolve, you have to not just store information, but you also have to transfer it. Well, the hydrophobic pairs were shown to, to be able to do that. But then you have to be able to change it without changing the bulk properties of this overall molecular system. And uh, the question was then, could you evolve into a region of sequence space where you had many of these funny hydrophobic pairs next to each other? And it turns out that's a quite a difficult thing to do. So the one thing, ox that had to be gored or whatever uh, analogy you used a moment ago, I've forgotten what it is, but one thing that we had, we showed was that only if you retain hydrogen bonding can you not only get from six letters to eight letters, but also you can have any sequence you want. Millie Georgiatis, who is our friend and collaborator at Indiana University Medical School in Indianapolis, she actually did crystal structures for three different sequences built with three different, very different uh, uh, DNA molecule sequences built from eight letter DNA and showed they were pretty much fit the Schrodinger a periodic crystal structure. They, they actually looks like they're capable of evolution. And since then, we've actually put some of these fragments of Hachimoji DNA under selective pressure and evolved molecules that bind to cancer cells and that bind to anthrax toxin and that transfer drug molecules into cancer cells and things like that. So in fact, mm. these molecules can evolve and they're uh, of course evolving in the laboratory, in the test tube under um, supervision of a graduate student who has to sit there and feed them all the time. But yeah, so it, but the, the, the thing uh, turns out is it turns out to be very important, not only actually to have the repeating backbone charges in the molecule, we think that's a universal now for life in the cosmos, but also hydrogen bonds between base pairs is what allows that system to be evolvable, to go past information storage and information transfer to actually evolve to become a more fit system. And so that's one of the things. So of course, the third thing we had to really work on was getting the system to have a phenotype, right? I mean, it does no good to have information and to transfer it to another molecule or even to evolve unless you have a phenotype of performance of that system that makes some molecules more fit than others. And one of the fun things was that Joseph Pitcherly, who was a former student, who's actually a graduate student of mine, but he's a professor at the University of uh, Chicago, um, collaborated with us to get these molecules to glow fluorescent green. <laughs> and so that's the thing yeah. that we have in that particular paper. In fact, it was a sort of a grand reunion, right? In order to get these molecules to transfer information, you have to have an enzyme. Now you could, if you were good, design an enzyme from scratch that will replicate eight letter DNA and make it into eight letter RNA, sort of Hachimoji transcription. But we're not that smart. So what we had to do was take enzymes that were known to do four letter transcription, making four letter RNA out of four letter DNA and get, evolve them by point mutation to get them to accept eight letter DNA and make eight letter RNA out of that. And that was actually done by Andy Ellington, who was also a graduate student, former graduate student of mine, 
many, many years ago. He's now a professor at the University of Texas. So he actually did the work that made the mutant polymerases that would actually handle eight letter nucleic acids. So it was like a grand reunion. We had all the former Benner students who've since gone off into the world, done great things, and now return to help out the old boss to solve all these little technical problems to get the system to actually work. So how long did it take to evolve this from four to eight? That sounds You can say 30 arduous. years. <laughs> well, I, it's a good question. The, wow. the question is, when do you start? Now, you can actually look at a research notebook of mine from 1985. That's 85, 1985. Yeah. That's 34 years ago, where it was signed by, you know, you're always supposed to get your notebook signed to protect the intellectual property that you put in it. But we wrote out the 12 letter genetic alphabet with functional groups in 1985 and had that notebook signed. So that's the short answer to the question is the idea is conceived of 34 years ago. Now the problem with well, that was, so I, mean, I remember there's a man named Jack Shostak who has since gone on to win a Nobel prize. But at the time he was, we all had read Tom Check's work and Sid Altman's work. So we all knew that RNA was a potentially two function molecule, storage, genetic information, a genetic molecule on one hand and a catalytic molecule on the other. And you know, we were all aware of the possibility of the RNA world. That is, there was an episode on early earth where RNA did both metabolism and genetics. And perhaps that was the first form of life on earth, which means that RNA must have emerged from a prebiotic soup. But I told Jack, I mean, there's a dinner in December of 1985, which I have notes from. I'm, I'm like uh, Brett Kavanaugh. I kept diaries, so I actually can tell you where, when and where that dinner was. Uh, but Jack, I told Jack about this, and, and Jack said, look, you're going to spend 10 years synthesizing these funny molecules. You're going to spend another year, 10 years, getting the enzymes to take them, uh, accept them. And by then, we will have gotten RNA molecules, just natural RNA, to do self-replication. And I said, no, 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 there's not enough functional groups on RNA, not enough, not enough information density on four letter RNA. And so we were both right. Jack still hasn't gotten <laughs> RNA to do self-replication. Phil Holliger is a lot closer. And Phil is of course a former student of mine also now working at MRC in Cambridge. So <laughs> I take credit for everything that my students do after they leave the lab, of course. But uh, yeah, so it's, we're 30 years out and neither RNA has become convincingly a life form on its own, nor has our system. Um, of course, keep in mind that there are five criteria for life. It has to store information, it has to transfer information, that information must have a phenotype, the system must be able to evolve, and then the system must be self-sustaining, which does not mean that it doesn't need to eat, but it means that it can go out and find its own food to eat. Now we steer mm -hmm. very clear of self-sustenance in our business because we don't want Andrew Pollack of the New York Times saying that our system raises hope and fear. And Carl Zimmer was very nice to us in that New York Times article as he did not worry about whether or not our system was going to lead to uh, an alien life form generated in the laboratory, in an earth laboratory taking over the earth. But other people have. There's another Bob or Robert Pollack who's actually written someplace where he's, they've argued that we don't have to worry about whether our descendants with this pitiful four letter nucleic acid system will have to compete against eight letter genetic systems that we have generated. And while I'm flattered, I mean, uh, by that, I, it, it does give us a little too much credit because our system is, you know, not um, um, self-sustaining, it's a long way from being self-sustaining. And so I think the question is a very interesting one to raise for the long term. Um, that, and I would love to discuss, I'd love to discuss that question long term, whether we have to worry about stuff coming out of our labs, out competing us. And that's, of course, the argument with artificial intelligence, which I'm assuming you, you're quite familiar with. So right, that's the same argument, right? Is that artificial intelligence will take over the planet. But I assure you, if artificial intelligence is to take over the planet, it will do so well, well before Hachimoji nucleic acids do. Well, Steve, you know, maybe, maybe there's a bright side, which is if we have the Hachimoji children and then the ordinary redheaded stepchildren, 
maybe all the racism could just move over to that and we could stop arguing about black and white and red. Well, and yeah. I mean, I and, find and, that, I mean, I mean, Barack Obama's father's DNA came out of Africa 80 years ago and his mother's DNA came out of Africa 80,000 years ago. And this is a mere eye blink on the geological time scale. So it's amazing how much we can spend talking about this, but so, yeah, I mean, there is this Star Trek view, right? First contact, uh, that is, when you make contact with the alien form, if you're Zephram Cochran, if you recall, the, 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 the Star Trek universe uh, makes contact with Vulcans, right? War, strife disappears from Earth in a generation. And the implication, although it's never said in Star Trek, is that you have a common enemy. Right. Of course, the Vulcans are not your common enemy. It turns out that a Vulcan man can mate with a human woman and produce Spock, who for, um, as a major biological conundrum, you can ask yourself, how is it possible that Spock can have a girlfriend who's American in the next generation, <laughs> right, or Huru, and, uh, and produce, tur because even a horse and a donkey can't get a productive, uh, fertile offspring. But that that discussion usually ends with the question, what part of the word fiction don't you understand? Well, maybe the title of this interview should be, how is it possible for these two creatures to mate, create Spock, and then for Spock to have an American girlfriend? That's a much more headline worthy <laughs> title than Hotch. Emoji DNA. I yeah, think. everybody likes Spock. Now, have you guys gotten your own emoji yet? Do you have a an official emoji in the emoji <laughs> library for, for no. your discovery? No, no. Actually, not until this moment have I even considered this. I mean, I'm I'm old school. I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I don't. I mean, I, I think that these things are cosmic wastes of time. And and you know, if I had you're not argue, missing anything. Steve. Is that right? I mean, if I if I had an argument to make, it's certainly going to take me more than 250 characters, or whatever it is. But yeah, so no, I don't have an emoji. Maybe you can design me one. <laughs> well, real quick here, closing up. Um, uh, what do you think? So two 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 strands to this question. First, let's start with with actual biology do you think that your um your eight letter dna has an application in synthetic biology using current real organisms to make like some other category of organisms is that a realistic yeah thing? i mean yes i mean a lot of uh, parts of hachimoji dna right now are in diagnostics applications that is, uh, there were some, two of the base pairs were put into a process that detects or measures the level of virus in your blood if you're infected with a hepatitis or HIV. Um, we have a cystic fibrosis assay. We had a Zika assay. We have, you know, if we squish a mosquito, we can tell you which of any of a number of pathogen viruses it's carrying. And you got to keep in mind that that's a lot of the way we can fund our research, right? There are clear medical implications for this. The second level of medical okay. implications comes from the fact that if this system can be evolving, you can evolve it to do things that you want molecules to do. And these molecules turn out to be better than the kinds of molecules that you can evolve with just four letter DNA or four letter RNA. So we have a whole project program here to evolve these molecules to get therapeutic agents. So in principle, you can evolve this molecules in this system to target them, not just to bind to, you know, tumor necrosis factor, but to bind it and cleave it. And, you know, Humira is one of the world's, so I guess it may in some years be the world's largest drug, which is an antibody that just binds to tumor necrosis factor. We have a system capable of evolving to bind and cleave it. And so we have a whole new class of therapeutic agents here. Now, the NIH has gotten on board. The Directors Fund has, I mean, the NIH, as you've already mentioned, the conservatism of peer review and the NIH staff is always upset at the projects that we as peers recommend to the NIH for, uh, for you know, funding uh, because we're too conservative. When I go to Bethesda and, and serve as a peer reviewer, I'm quite conservative as well. 
So what the NIH director has done is set up these programs where they give out a, you know, a year, uh, rather large hunks of money to develop sort of blue skies ideas in technology. And, and we were one of eight people uh, a year ago that got this, one of these projects. And that's to create E. coli bacteria that use, replicate, and eventually evolve eight letter expanded genetic alphabet systems. And so, yeah, right now, again, however, it's, you know, what, what's wrong when you try to put unnatural systems into natural systems. So try to put eight letter DNA into a E. coli bacterium and get it to replicate eight letter DNA. You discover a truism. And that is that if the system hasn't evolved to manage eight letter DNA, it's not going to want to manage eight letter DNA. There are a few exceptions to that, but in general, when you put an unnatural molecule into a living system that it hasn't seen, living system has not seen that at any point in its four billion years of evolution, it does not work very well with it. So almost 100% of what we do in trying to get expanded DNA alphabets, synthetic DNA alphabets into living cells is to manage the fact that the cell fights us, doesn't want it, doesn't know how to handle it. And so, you know, we're a year into this project now and, you know, we're working very hard to do what you just suggested and that is to have a semi-synthetic life form. I think that's what Floyd Bromisberg's term is. It, now, most of it is natural, but some pieces of it, especially the genetic pieces, are going to be synthetic. And that's the kind of molecule that, uh, sorry, the kind of living system that can make unnatural molecules. You can imagine this package being itself a diagnostics package so I can eat E. coli, which has expanded genetic alphabet in it and use in my gut the expanded genetic alphabet to signal for colon cancer, for example. So these are the sort of blue sky things that the NIH is now funding, um, but it goes not mm -hmm. through standard peer review, but through this sort of special program. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, that's, that's fascinating. So, and then there's this idea of data storage. So, I don't know if most people know that DNA stores information at thousand or million times the density of a hard drive. And now what this does is this gets you from four to the power of three combinations to eight to the power of three. Yep. So that's 64 up to 512. So, I mean, just data storage implications. Can, can you talk about uh, what the meaning of that is and in, in what a, a plausible actual application might be in, in the technology side. Sure. No, I mean, I spent a day at, at Microsoft uh, about two years ago, and uh, we just put together a team. There was a program called iARPA, which is trying to use the DARPA trademark, the Advanced Research Project, ARPA, but with information. And we actually got a nice team from Complete Genomics and from Gaston Gonet, who's an information scientist who I had a long acquaintance with, and, and uh, a couple other people to, to meet a proposal, an RFA, a request for applications that um, said we were looking at DNA to store genetic information. And of course, um, we said, well, you know, you're not thinking broadly enough. You are uh, not supposed to be thinking about DNA, it's supposed to be thinking about eight-letter DNA, right? Because it's got a higher information density. And of course, DNA itself is, is very bad stability-wise. I mean, it's not, it's not hopelessly bad, but it's bad. So you rectify the DNA, make it better DNA, even if you're going to do DNA. And so the proposal was not funded, and we were debriefed a couple of weeks ago, and, and the program manager said, look, Stephen, when you the government asks for something, you're supposed to provide an offer to them. <laughs> Now, we had a two-year pre-proposal thing where we had, uh, trying to define the scope of this project, you didn't show up to tell us about eight-letter DNA. So when we asked for it, we didn't ask for it. And so since you offered it, but you offered it too late, you should have shown up in the time when we were formulating the package. Uh, and so we might do that the next time. But you're right. I mean, there's no reason to be constrained by natural four-letter DNA for many, many reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons you are constrained for it is because you can buy from chemical supply houses, the building blocks, and you can order up from integrated DNA technologies or tri-link DNA of any sequence, and you can then sequence and send it out. And you have to build a platform for doing alternative DNA, and that's work. But if you're ARPA and you want to actually do 
you know, enter the new millennium and see, you know, Nirvana and have those spaces open up, then you decide what you really want at the end of the day is something that looks sort of like DNA, but is not DNA. And you're supposed to build the platform that actually creates it. And so, hey, well, what can I say? We offered them the platform and they decided that they just want to do mundane DNA. And so that's what they're doing. <laughs> well, Steve, this has been fabulous really fun interview. Um, and uh, so this has been, I've been here with Steve Benner of the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution and um, great discoveries, great, great book, Life, the Universe and the Scientific Method. I, if, if you like chemistry and origin of life questions, you'll love this book. And uh, well, thanks for doing what you do. And thanks for your your healthy disdain for excessive <laughs> advocacy in the field of science. It's we aim to please. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much, Frank. Until next time, this is the Evolution 2.0 podcast, bridging science, technology, business, and the big questions. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or on your preferred player. If you like the show, rate us on iTunes. Join our email list and social media at CosmicFingerprints.com.